presenting the Mirth Parade. John Wilson as the drum major. Well, here we are again, ladies and gentlemen, so let's all pull our caps down over our eyes and put on rubber sole shoes because, aha, this time we dedicate the Mirth Parade to those Knights of the Handcuff, those gumshoe Sherlocks, the detectives. Look out, look out, look out for Jimmy Valentine, for he's a pal of mine, a said a man of God, with a touch that lingers in his hand. Combination of your pocket book. Look out, look out, for when you see his light and shine, that's the time to jump right up and shout. Hell, you kill a horse and cart, you'd even steal a girl and cart when Jimmy Valentine gets out. Well, here we go to detective headquarters and we find Secret Service operative number K9 at work on a case. Operative K-9, for your information, otherwise known as Yogi Jorgensen, loves making arrests. He has arrested thousands of criminals. In fact, we find the good Yogi in a state of arrested animation himself. Yogi Jorgensen. <laughs> How do, ladies and gentlemen? You are listening to Yogi Jorgensen, the Hindu mystic. Uh, with the aid of the crystal ball, I am answering your questions over the radio. Looking into the magic crystal ball today, I see that the Ku Klux Klan held its annual clan bake yesterday. <laughs> uh, the clan is getting back to nature. Uh, they are getting closer to their tarred and feathered friends. Uh, the clan bake of the Ku Klux Klan wasn't much of a success. Uh, too many dumb clucks. <laughs> I got a letter here from uh, Dr. Hugo Svensson. He say, Dear Yogi, I listen to you on the radio, and that thank you is marvelous. Uh, I am the foot doctor who takes care of the city's police force. Uh, one of my patients is a detective who weighs 350 pounds, and he is a yard wide. Uh, he has got flat feet, and he runs his heels over. Uh, I don't know what to do to cure him of his flat feet. Can you tell me? Well, Dr. Svensson, I am taking a squint into the crystal ball. Uh, so you take care of the feet of the city's police force. Well, you certainly live on the flat of the land. Uh, you say this here cop weighs 350 pounds? Well, that sounds like a lot of bull to me. Uh, you say he was a yard wide, too. Uh, I catch on now. All bull and the yard wide. Uh, his heels run over? Well, that is the way it should be. It says so in the scriptures. Your cop run it over. Uh, I see in the crystal ball that you can't do nothing for him. You can't do nothing for a flat-footed cop. Uh, even when the policeman puts his best foot forward... It usually falls flat. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, the great yogi conclude uh, with a prayer of India. A prayer like a breath of spring. Allah, Allah, Allah Tosis. <laughs> You 
know, ladies and gentlemen, the other day Yogi wandered into a police radio studio where the announcer was calling all cars, calling all cars. Yogi asked the radio operator to call him a taxi. Uh, You're a taxi, said the operator, and, well, he wasn't very far wrong. But here's the policewoman, Tizzy Lish, who's been hanging around street corners arresting men for not flirting with her. Tizzy Lish. Hello, folks, is. And a great big Trevian, grazioso, come a style, skull, jiu-jitsu, suey cow. <laughs> My, it's wonderful to have control of the languages like that, isn't it? <laughs> well, I had quite a time today, and speaking of time, it seems only yesterday when I patty caked with President Lincoln. Well, let us forget time, will we? <laughs> you know, I'm in such constant fear of being kidnapped that I have to have a detective with me constantly. I received a letter from a gentleman saying he would like to whisk me away. Well, he didn't exactly say whisk me away. He said he would like to do away with me. (laughs) Isn't that ducky? (laughs) So as I say, even as I stand here, I'm filled with beer. Fear. (laughs) But I guess it's just one of the little problems that confront a beautiful girl these days, isn't it? And as I lay my silken tresses on my dresser, pardon my pillow each night, I lie there like a startled spawn. (laughs) And I finally fall to sleep, and I'm in the arms of Morpheus. Of course, that's just an expression. (laughs) My, I wished it wasn't. (laughs) So as I say, don't long to be beautiful like me. Now, I've received so much mail. Mail, my, that word sounds interesting. But I must go on. I feel that instead of a recipe, I must answer one or two letters from anxious ones. One young lady writes and says, You are so beautiful. I would like to see you on the stage in a love scene. Well, I would like to say that so would I. In fact, I second the motion. If you know what I mean. Now, another girl writes for advice and says, I am a sales girl in a department store, and when my sweetheart leaves me each night, he kisses me. But I'm so bashful, I never know what to say. Now, what would you say, Miss Lish? Well, if I was a sales girl, I would say, Will that be all? (laughs) (laughs) And as I see my time is about up, as the boys in San Quentin sometimes say, (laughs) I think that'll be all. So I must scurry along as I have to give a cooking lesson to some carpet salesmen on Brussels sprouts. (laughs) So I'll leave you as the dentists always say at parting, Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> You know, ladies and gentlemen, Tizzy Lish saw a man swiping a handful of peanuts the other day and arrested him for impersonating a policeman. Well, here we are back at detective headquarters where we find the chief of the Arkansas Hillbilly Detectives, Bob Burns, who came to the city hunting for a crime wave. He said that he found so many crime waves that that made him seasick. Bob Burns. Hi, Don, I kind of thought maybe these people would like to hear about an uncle of mine down in Arkansas. You know, all his life he was awful slow about catching on to things. He couldn't seem to grasp an idea. They say he was 14 years old before he learned to wave bye-bye. You know, when, when, when he grew up, he used to drink four quarts of moonshine every Saturday night, and he wouldn't start feeling it until the following Tuesday. One Tuesday, my uncle busted into a lodge meeting over the general merchandise store, and they threw him out. He went back in, and they threw him out again. Then my uncle went out in the woods and sat on a log and studied over it for three days. Suddenly, he jumped to his feet, and he says, I know why they threw me out of there. It's because they didn't want me up there, that's why. <laughs> so, so he checked up on it and found out that that really was the reason why they threw him out. And then he says to himself, now, if I can figure out things like that... Uh, In three days, there's no end to what I can deduct if given the proper time. So uh, he took a correspondence course on how to be a detective. It is a regular three-month course, but my uncle was so interested in it that he studied on it for seven years. (laughs) Finally, he got his diploma, and he left home to go out in the world and get some practical experience. Three months later, we got a telegram from him, and it says, I'm in the Blue Ridge Mountains on the trail of the Lonesome Pine. Well, my uncle came back home and he made him made a name for himself when he arrested the local pretzel maker for making crooked dough. See? So uh, they elected him town constable. And the first day in office, he got a bulletin from St. Louis offering a re- reward for the capture of an escaped convict up there. On the bulletin was uh, four pictures of the convict, a picture of the right side of his face, one of the left, 
one of the front and one showing the back of his head. Three hours later, my uncle sent a wire to St. Louis, and he says, I have three of your men, and I'm on the trail of the four. <laughs> Well, Bob's going back to Arkansas where they hang horse thieves instead of pictures. And now here are two uninformed policemen, Officers Brown and Lavelle. Someone asked them why they carried handcuffs, and they answered, Oh, they'll do in a pinch. Which reminds me of the sleepwalking kleptomaniac who walked up to a policeman and said, Pinch me and see if I'm awake. Brown and Lavelle. <laughs> hey, honey, what's the big idea of your impersonating a police officer? <laughs> what do you mean impersonating a police officer? You ain't fooling anybody. I saw you standing in front of that fruit stand helping yourself to the bananas. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Oh, quit your kidding. You know, I, I believe I'd like to be a police officer at that. Oh, don't I, tell I'd me. like to be a detective. Well, you are. I'm a detective? Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I thought you said defective. <laughs> <laughs> if you were a detective boy, you'd be hard-boiled. <laughs> what makes you think that? <laughs> because I'd keep you in hot water all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'd be different. I'd be a gentle and polite detective. You'd be a polite detective. Mm -hmm. Tell me, dear, would you give people a chance to remove their hats before you hit them on the head? <laughs> Oh, I, I wouldn't hit anybody on the head. No, sir. We wouldn't hit anybody on the head. <laughs> we? Where do you get that we stuff? Well, detectives always travel in pairs, don't they? <laughs> like kippers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're safer in a crowd, aren't you? Is that why you married me? No, no. I married you for your disposition. <laughs> I wonder why fat women are so good-natured. Maybe it's because it takes them so long to get mad and clear through. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I, th I think you'd be a good detective at that, honey. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Well, what makes you think I'd be a good detective? Well, you chased me until I caught you, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Brown will now detect a few bars on his xylophone and play. Save a rainy day for me. Detectives of the Mirth Parade, ladies and gentlemen, because the show is all over for this time, and until we see you again, this is Don Wilson bidding you goodbye.